Hello, this is Janet Gallant, <clears throat> excuse me, welcoming you to Love Letters Live. Today's guest is, of course, another exceptional person. And I, I'm just going to go right to introducing Emilio Palame, who has an enormous history in music and acting, and you're going to know him when he starts to talk. Um, Emilio, can I just go right to you? And before we talk about today's subject, which is a movie you just made, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be Peggy Lee's musical director. Well, uh, the, it's an interesting story because I met a, a gentleman, a fantastic guitar player named John Chiodini, uh, when I was uh, directing the Fredonia Jazz Ensemble back in 1977. And um, he came, he was playing guitar with Maynard Ferguson. And we met there and he said, well, I'm gonna be moving out to Los Angeles uh, after this tour is over and uh, we should get together and work on some music and stuff. So that is what happened. I met John here in LA after he moved here from, uh, he was originally from Rhode Island. And um, we started working together on different projects, uh, playing gigs together and orchestrating and arranging uh, different projects. Uh, together and then uh, he got the gig with Peggy Lee uh, and they were playing at a place called um, it, it, the small theater in Westwood called the Westwood Playhouse and it was a very beautiful small intimate theater which Peggy Lee loved because she loved being close to the audience it, it, was, it was only 450 seats mm -hmm. so the way what ended up happening is um, her regular pianist from New York, Mike Renzi, had to go back to New York to, to do some work. So uh, she needed to get a substitute. And she hired three different piano players three nights in a row and then uh, and fired them three nights in a row. Do you know why she fired them so quickly? Uh, she's very particular about what a piano player plays behind her. And she had told me that uh, I learned this later that it's just it's to her it's like almost like a marriage you have to really really tune into what she wants and what she wants to do so um, I, I I didn't realize that she had fired those guys three and one of them was a pretty famous piano player and I want, want to say who he was uh, but um, I got I got on the it, it was interesting I was playing a, a, a a gig at a place called the Nucleus Nuance, which is not there anymore here in, in Los Angeles, but it was co-owned by Herbie Hancock and a, and a few uh, important jazz people. And I was playing there and it was one o'clock in the morning and um, John's wife actually called the payphone that was near the restroom at the place. And she, she said, you know, she asked somebody, is, is, is Emilio there? And I showed up and picked up the phone. She said, how would you like to play with Peggy Lee tomorrow night? And I'm like, um, okay, I guess. And so John being the good friend uh, that he is to me, uh, we met at my uh, house at two o'clock in the morning and he brought the, he didn't have the piano book, he had the guitar book. And so he went through all the songs with me and told, showed me the tempos and what I was expected to be able to do. And we stayed up until about 6 a.m. And, and then finally crashed and then, um, I was so shaky at that point because I had been up for so long. He came and picked me up and drove me to the Westwood Playhouse. Peggy Lee came out. Uh, she said, here, I do this little um, uh, recit um, in the middle of Folks Who Live on the Hill, which is an absolutely gorgeous song. And uh, I played that little interlude, it was only eight bars. And she said, just follow me. And then she said, I do Wind Beneath My Wings, rubato. So you just, as like a recit, and it's just you and me. So um, play a little bit of that. I did the first verse and got to the bridge. She said, okay, see you later. And that was it. And, now, were uh, you, given who Peggy Lee is, as excellent as you are, and I happen to know this because I've seen you perform. And um, the only thing wrong with the show that you did that I saw was that it ended. Yeah. Uh, but given, given who Peggy Lee was, were you intimidated? Oh, I was scared to death. Uh-huh, that makes sense. Yeah, I was really nervous. And I just had to kind of collect everything that I had done with all my performances with uh, other jazz artists and, and my background from the Fredonia Jazz Ensemble and, and playing in front of a lot of people. And, and so um, I just 
concentrated as much as I could. And, and I, and she liked what I did. And I ended up working with her for 11 years after that. Okay. So you knew that she liked what you did because she didn't fire you or she said, oh, I, just day by day, you kept coming back. I mean, yes, I, you know, it was, it, and I kind of realized it was a good marriage. Yeah. It, 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 she liked the fact that I didn't play a lot, you know, I didn't, I wasn't all over the keyboard. And that was part of the reason why she fired the other guys because they played too much. Uh -huh. And she's, she, you know, her whole thing is a kind of a minimalist thing. Yeah. So I had to play very, and one of the most difficult parts about playing with her is, is that she sang songs, the ballads that she sang were very slow. Uh, I and, remember and that. You, yeah, and you really have to get into that zone to play a good groove, but really slow. It's, it's a lot easier to just play something swinging, mm -hmm. but when you're really down there in that tempo, Janet, it, you've got to really... You got to really um, be in the moment. Oh well, I, you know, I've I've heard and then actually experienced that fast rhythm is so much easier than mm -hmm. slow rhythm. Yep, it really is. Yeah, it, it takes another um, part of your being to keep that groove and make it salt. Like for her, it had to be sultry. It had to be um, sexy, for what a lack of a better word, because mm -hmm. she she was really into that whole sort of like a slow burn you know that that was her thing and um and so I was able to do that fortunately and and I I had to keep sort of um I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this um she kept giving me little tips along the way it's like well you know when you play this can you play uh a little uh softer here or can you play a little less right here or oh. go ahead you know have fun with this do that you know and and she, she was a good director then yeah she oh well she knew every note of of her arrangement so she could tell if something was out of place and and the thing that was uh, you mentioned about being intimidating mm -hmm. uh she stood in the crook of the piano uh -huh. and, they, and they took the the lid of the piano off so her ears were about 18 inches you know maybe three feet from the strings uh -huh. stand, standing right there so she heard every single thing you did you know did she play the piano herself she does play a little bit yeah she i i i heard her play it because we used to rehearse in her living room in in her uh, mansion in bel-air and every once in a while she'd sit down and play stuff on the piano it was it was she had a nice touch you know nice okay well i want to thank you for bringing us up to closer date and today we're going to talk about I, I do want to mention just so everybody will know that you're also an actor and people have seen you in things why don't you, you want to mention a couple of things you've been in that people might recognize you by well the, the two biggest movies that i were i was in that that uh, ran for quite a long time on netflix was um a movie called expelled which i remember that yeah which is basically like an homage to um Ferris Bueller's Day Off, mm -hmm. and I played the, the principal of the school, and <clears throat> excuse me, and this young, uh, talented kid named um, Cameron Dallas, who was a big uh, internet star at that time, he had 23 million followers between wow. his, his Instagram, his Facebook, and he was, at that time, uh, the, the platform of Vine was very uh, popular, and th those were like little six second, eight second, little funny bits, and and so he kind of made his claim to fame through that. And the company that was uh, producing the movie took advantage of that. And that's why the movie was so popular. And I, I gained a lot of notoriety and sort of went a lot. I, I didn't have a, I should have started a Twitter account because I probably would have gotten millions of followers dovetailing off of him. But um, so that, that movie, uh, it's a very funny movie. Um, and I, I play the uh, ridiculous um principal of the school and then another movie which is going to kind of lead us into um the knights of swing thank you uh, good yeah it was a movie that i did uh called prodigy which is a, a very very well written and and conceived uh psychological thriller it's not gory it's not you know real scary it's just very intense and the 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 gentleman the actor who played uh the, the psychotherapist in the movie uh richard neal uh, uh -huh. and i ended up uh, becoming really good friends. And I really respected his acting ability because 
he had a tremendous amount of dialogue to learn uh, for that movie because the scenes were very involved with just him and this young girl who, who had these uh, telekinesis powers and that. And I play a, a really horrible, uh, mean Colonel, uh, <laughs> Colonel Birch in it, who represents the, the, uh, the military part of, of the government that wants to keep this young girl under wraps because we think she's a, a threat to national security. So, um, so Richard and I got to be good friends. So when it came to the Knights of Swing, which we'll talk about more, uh, we cast him in the lead role. Okay, so I, I knew that name from that you had cast him. Talk about the Knights of Swing. Let's just say it is a full length movie that you produced. Yes. And did you, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Did you write it with Roland? Yeah, it, actually there was three writers. Uh, Roland conceived of the original Tell story. us Roland's last name. Roland Jacks. Yeah, uh, and he's 88 years old, by the way. Oh. And, and so part of the story of the, of the movie is, is based on his high school experience actually playing in a band called the Knights of Swing. And they actually did go to the Battle of the Bands and win. Uh, and that was in the late 40s here in, in uh, Linwood, California, which we loosely, loosely uh, have our story um, uh, written about. And so, so David Gutel, who's, uh, who co-directed the movie with me, uh, and I took what Rollin had written, because originally Rollin conceived The Knights of Swing as a series. And so he had 10 episodes. Wow. And, and we filmed the first two episodes, uh, which made up about 45 minutes. And then uh, COVID hit. Uh -huh. and, and so we've, we've decided that, like, well, we're not going to be able to do all these 10 episodes. So we, David and I condensed the, uh, the script <laughs> down to um, a feature film. Will you tell us, I, I know it's fiction, essentially, but you know, good fiction always touches something that's important and reaches us and says something. What, can you, can you tell us the plot, the storyline of the Knights of Swing? Yeah, yeah the, uh, basically it's the story of these six young uh, jazz, high school jazz musicians. Uh, and, and they have a small group Called the Jam and Pajama Men, and uh, and their dream is to have uh, a, a swing and big band, and so they recruit uh, the science and math teacher who they know had a background in big band jazz, and they convince him to become uh, the director of the band, and then they recruit other musicians uh, from the school, and then um, this young girl who who auditioned for. Um, the lead singing role and she gets it she has two girlfriends that she's been singing with for a long time uh growing up and they become what we call the three b's because it's bev barb and bonnie and they're like the andrew sisters mm -hmm. and and they sang so incredibly well okay, so this, excuse me this takes place in the 40s yeah the movie is is in uh, era. it's set in 1947 so uh -huh. all of the uh uh the cars, the, the costuming, the, the oh, homes, right. everything. So th that was um, a really important part to make uh, the movie uh, very, very uh, realistic in terms of the period. And, and, what, and were the, we, what were the social issues? Well, that's the thing um, that we had uh, two uh, black musicians in the band and the band is actually quite diverse for 1947. And racism was very, very prevalent in the late forties. and. Um, so the community uh, re rejects the fact that we have an integrated band because not only do we have um, these two black guys in the band, but we also have uh, a couple of uh, Hispanic uh, musicians um, and we have some girls in the band, which in 1947 was very odd. Yeah, there was just that one all-girl band in the 40s. Yeah, right. yeah, there were because, because the musicians uh, were uh, engaged in World War II, oh. uh, uh, a lot of male musicians weren't around. They were they were playing overseas, so it, here in America, they, they started having all female big bands. I remember a couple, yeah. <coughs> so what what happens, or do you not want to say because people should go look at the movie instead? Yeah, the people should watch the movie, but but just to give you an overview, there's a lot of um, rancor from from the the community and uh, other parents from from the school 
because the band is integrated. Now, and this, so you, you, you were aware of that because parents went to the school to object? Yeah, yeah. I, they, I play, once again, I play the principal of the school uh, and, and one of the, the mothers of, of, of one of the young girls who actually doesn't get picked to be in one of the singers in the band, uh, her mother, and we find out later why she's such a racist, but she, she comes to me and says, you know, you, this band is gonna be um, a big problem for you. you, you mark my words. And so she teams up with some other members uh, when we have a, uh, of the community, mm -hmm. uh, when we have this meeting uh, to talk about, you know, funding the band and, and trying to get uh, the band to go to the battle of the bands and getting, trying to garner community support for the band. And uh, she stands up in the middle of the meeting and says, says, you know, these kids shouldn't be playing in this band. And she makes some very racist comments and everybody in the, in the, uh, the meeting goes, kind of pits themselves against each other. And that begins uh, her relationship with these two other gentlemen who, who are very determined to not have this band go forward. So, so. It's, really, it's a little, a little micro civil war. Yes, it is. Exactly. And there's other issues in it because um, our main character, Gifford Williams, who writes the songs for the band and leads and is one of the lead singers. And he also plays saxophone, which his character is loosely based on Rollin because Rollin was an alto sax player and a singer in the band uh -huh. and uh, in the Knights of Swing. And uh, our, our lead character, Gifford, his older brother, Wesley, has just come back from World War II and he has a serious case of PTSD. And so he's not very nice to his younger brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, he joins forces with the other people who are against the band because he's not necessarily a racist himself, but what he sees is that while he was over overseas fighting this war, his younger brother's just fooling around singing and playing in a band with a, with a bunch of, of, of his buddies. And he, he thinks it's a big waste of time for him uh, based on how he and, and his father think of what he's doing with his life in playing in this band and he should, be doing he should be doing something much more serious so well, I, was, I was gonna say you know you touched on something well the whole thing is touching on so many things that are important today and always but the business of he's not really a racist himself but he gets to benefit from using other people's racism it seems exactly that's exactly what happens. That's good. That's very, it's very astute of you to, to, to put that together because that is exactly what happens. It sounds, like, it sounds like a huge theme and one that uh, we certainly see today about people who feel they're not racist, but they're benefiting. Right. Yeah. And that's, and that's what ends up happening. And, and it's, it's really a heartwarming story because people change in this movie. People oh. have, have a reckoning in this movie. People, uh, learn what unconditional love is between the two brothers, uh, between uh, Mrs. Barlutsky, <laughs> yeah. uh, Mrs. Mrs. Barlutsky, who's who's the uh, antagonist, who's the woman who was causing all the trouble, and and what a reckoning she has uh, for the mistakes that she's made, and uh, and there's also a, a relationship between Wesley, the older brother, and a young girl, and he he ends up insulting her because she has. She had polio when she was uh, a young girl, and so she walks with a limp. And and uh, he accidentally, because she accuses him of stealing the band's music. There's 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 a, a great deal of uh, subplots in this. I can movie. see that. Yeah. yeah. There's 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 all these through lines of story that interweave and uh, all really come to the climax of the movie which in the end, they go to the Battle of the Bands and I'm not gonna tell you what happens. Okay, yes, don't. But you know, there's something about, I mean, I'm, I'm smiling because I'm gathering there is essentially a happy ending. And well, I would, I, I, th I would say so, yes, this is a very feel good movie. Well, uh, okay, feel good movie is good. I, you know, my, my granddaughter once said to me, she was about, she was five and we were watching something and it had a terrible ending and she was very upset. And mm -hmm. she said, and I think she speaks for a lot of us, and she said, you know, I don't mind trouble in the beginning. I don't mind trouble in the beginning. And oh, no, I like a happy beginning. I don't mind trouble in the middle, but I want a happy ending. Mm -hmm. And well, there, is, there is something about 
we learn something from, as you say, a feel good movie, we learn something about seeing resolutions and we learn something about seeing people change. Yeah, and that's that's so much of what this movie is about. Okay. It's about, about healing, it's about forgiveness, it's about unconditional love. And, and, and the interesting thing is, is, is how the music brings all of that together. And that's the catalyst. And if there's one point where Mr. Miller says, you know, I, it, there's something about this band. It's not, it's not just the music. It's not the band. It's, it's almost like it's a refuge for these kids. It's, 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 it's like a, it's almost like their home and, and they feel at home in the music and the, the, the racism goes away for them uh -huh. the problems that they're having with, with uh, the post-war issues go away and they just enjoy being together and celebrating uh, the joy of this great swing music, big band music. You know, I would I would agree. It seems to me that there is no glue like music to bring people together and to change people and to get rid of differences. Um, I think that's why people have been so violently objecting to certain kinds of music, you know, like rock and roll and heavy metal. When the music comes on and it's too powerful, I think the establishment can't trust what's it can't trust that things will continue as they are. And well, that, you know, the swing era music uh, had a joy to it that was that came out of World War II because people were so, uh, you know, down and and oh. concerned and and uh, you know that there was so much oppression from what happened in in World War II uh, that the swing era music had this joy to it. And, and the freedom of dancing, jitterbug dancing, and, and we actually had jitterbug yeah. content in the movie. Uh, and, and so, um, yes, it, it, it is a uniting force in this movie and it's a uniting force in the world. And we just, you know, how art imitates life and, and vice yeah. versa. Yes. That's, Roland, Roland really wanted to make sure that people came away from this movie with a very good feeling in their heart and a feeling of joy and, and, and being inspired. And, that, and from the reviews that we've gotten so far, I mean, people are just thrilled with what how this movie makes them feel. In fact, at one of the screenings that we did when we were first working on the just the, the pilot episode, uh, one of the, the audience members said, you know, you know, this movie is, and he was looking, searching for a word, he said, you know, this movie's healthy. Oh, yeah, that's I, I think that's a funny thing to say about a movie, but, he said, but it's healthy, it makes, it makes you feel good, it makes you, you know, thankful and and appreciative and and uh i i i can't tell you janet i'm i feel so blessed that i that the last three years of my life has been working on this movie and putting this all together um i i think you you know that I've, i wore so many hats in this movie that if i wasn't bald i would be <laughs> uh, <laughs> well let me ask I, something people you know, can I, see, people can see this movie where I mean, movies aren't necessarily at big theaters only anymore. No, we, we're actually on a, a brand new platform, and it's it's called Vimeo on Demand, and Vimeo has been around for a long time. Right. Uh, that and YouTube have been two of the main places where people have uh, put you know original material. But the thing about Vimeo is, uh, and the, and this part of Vimeo is, is they have the the highest quality streaming for picture and sound of anything oh. that's on the internet. And people, nice have that. That people have been commenting on that when they watch the movie that uh, they think uh, how great it looks and sounds. It's well, let me ask you something. You know, it's just a little confusing these days because there are separate streaming platforms and sometimes you can get a movie only on one. Is this true of Knights of Swing only yeah, on, Vimeo? Yeah, on Vimeo On Demand? Yes. And, and well, of course, things change. I mean, maybe it'll be elsewhere later, but also movies that are no longer big studio movies are winning awards like crazy. So mm -hmm. is any movie uh, an appropriate candidate for an Academy Award? This movie? Any, yes. Yeah, well, of course, yeah. Any, any, okay. Oh, you mean if it's not done by a major studio? Well, it's not done by a major studio, but now we're kind of considering, you know, Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, yeah. they're making movies that are just gorgeous yeah and that, that's true okay so any any major movie can be a candidate all right good luck that's good to know i hope you got one okay. well that would be lovely <laughs> okay so let me ask you something just briefly because um 
you know, we're about love letters over here and the power of letters. And of course, <laughs> in the 40s, and by the way, I'm old enough to know all this because I was there um, and a participant in life in the 40s. And um, we wrote letters. I mean, that's how we can, if you were to write a love letter right now, who would it be to? And I know you do write letters. I do. Um, well, I, we write notes to each other all the time. You met my wife, Ellen. I certainly did. <laughs> and um, I, would, I would definitely write um, a love letter to her and because she's been so supportive with me because it's not been easy being around someone who's a, a, a very achievement oriented person like I am bordering on work, workaholic. Yeah. Um, and so she's have, look how much you get done. Yeah. And, and she's, she's really supportive in it. Also her personality, she, cause she's an art of an artist herself. Um, uh, of a very, very fine, uh, artist. In fact, uh, the, um, she drew this, which is the, the cover of my, my CD. And I don't know if you can see that. Oh, don't I have that? Yeah, you do. I do. And it, so you can see the intricacy right. of what, what she did. That's just thousands and thousands of, of dots and dashes. It's called yeah. uh, stippling. And, uh, so because she has that artistic temperament and she doesn't mind spending time by herself. Nice. So when I, I, I work out of my home, I have a recording, this is my recording studio here uh, in, in, at our house. And so we're always in the same uh, uh, environment and being here in, in our home, but she has her own studio where she does her artwork or mm -hmm. works on our business. And, and you know, we, 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 we are together on and off throughout the day. And so when COVID hit, it was nothing different for us. That's right, I, I realize that, yeah. Right. We've been in this house together, you know, for we've been together for um, almost 40 years. Oh. And, and so, uh, yeah, I'd write a love letter you're, to her. You're both so lucky because you each have just an exceptional person. Yes, okay. So I wanna thank you for doing this with me. And I wanna just say again, that we can all see this exceptional movie on Vimeo. You just Vimeo on demand. Vine, well, all you do is put it in the little search box and it will take you to, you can just sign up and join. That's right. It's an easy thing to do. Yes. yes okay. All right. Thank you, dear, for doing this. I wish you, I wish you luck. This is, this movie is so good and it touches on so many things that we need to hear and learn about over and over and over again in the forties and the fifties and the eighties and the nineties and Maybe someday the lessons will be finished and will be just a wonderful, wonderful society. I, I love that. Yes, me too. <laughs> that sounds like a prayer to me. That's great. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess it is. I guess it is. And I'm going to ask you to come back, speaking of prayer, because there's something else you're doing that I want to talk to you about. But meanwhile, For sure. pardon? For sure. Oh, yes. Good. Okay. I, I'm glad about that. I love talking to you, and I'm so glad we're friends and that we ever met in the first place. And I'll yep. tell you goodbye. We we can thank David Zimmerman for that. Uh, I, you know, I do. I do. Yes. Actually, I'm having lunch with him and his mama Friday. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So until next time, this is Janet Gallen saying goodbye. And um, next time will be something else terrific. Thank you, dear. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.